Hello everyone, today we talk about the expansion of the French Kingdom during the 13th century. Um, up to now I haven't done many videos on French medieval history, but um, it's not a matter of really of preference. You, you've probably seen that I've made um, <coughs> like 32 videos on medieval Italy, other 13 videos on medieval Germany, uh, chiefly because I was discussing um, Holy Roman Imperial history, but not only, and and yet French history is really a, a very big chapter on its own. Um, <coughs> once again, um, the philosophy of my videos is really to give um, uh, what I deem to be the right space um, to the mm, to singular topics that I find to be uh, relatively neglected uh, <coughs> in our in our time uh, in terms of mass awareness of mm, the so famous popular culture that I mention all the time um, not because indeed people don't know that France, uh, France has been um, important but um, because I realize that aside from this there is no mm, further interest to understand um, and especially, mm, um, it's a dimensional problem. Like, I think that most of medieval history is in popular culture monopolized around and, you know, revolving uh, in a certain sense around a very few topics, like the Vikings, the Crusades, and that's it. That's the Middle Ages. Um, it doesn't make sense. Uh, it doesn't make sense, especially because there are so... I mean, I think the beauty of the Middle Ages really stands in the diversity that existed within um, <coughs> within Europe itself. So, what intrigues me the most is to, like, take a map of medieval Europe, observing that, a relatively mm, well-detailed poli political map, and to look at these um, <coughs> kingdoms and principalities and and city-states and all, and to say, wow, look at how many different political entities, look at how... And, and, and let's go find their peculiar characteristics. Now, the history of the Kingdom of France in, in, in European history is of enormous importance. I think relatively to the Middle Ages, I think the, the, the most important countries in terms of influence, of relevance, of, of sheer... Mm, you know, massive mm, importance, let's say, were definitely France and Italy. Very difficult to say which prevailed. Probably Italy was definitely the most influential. But in terms of, um, of a un you know, of, um, of greatness, of a, uh, of a unique um, uh, um, political entity, we can say definitely the Kingdom of France embodies the Middle Ages. It embodies uh, the um, it embodies universalism. It embodies feudalism. Um, <coughs> it embodies the um, knighthood as well. Um, paradoxically, more than the Holy Roman Empire, because the Holy Roman Empire had to be essentially all about this, and definitely also Germany and and Italy um, are mm, framed into a. <coughs> you know, uh, this broader um, medieval picture as leading countries, but definitely France set a model of, of a lot of things, actually. Um, um, you can argue Paris, with its university, was the, the center of medieval theology in the West, definitely. Um, France, in itself, was the cradle of feudalism. I mean, feudalism is something that was born from the Carolingian Empire, there was nor a French nor a German Empire, because simply France and Germany as such did not exist. But let's say that the base, uh, let's say the, of the estates, of the, and, and even of those <coughs> um, clientary tradition that triggered the birth of uh, feudalism was definitely set in France, northeastern France, also part of s parts of Belgium, definitely, but chiefly France, and uh, and that's where, in fact, chivalric culture developed most because society was more mm, organized into a, a feudal fashion, more than Germany, more than Italy. Uh, if you take the 
enormous achievement um, cultural achievements of the Italians during the Middle Ages, you understand that a great part of their um, <coughs> literary development stemmed actually from French traditions. Telling the truth, not exactly French in the proper sense of the world, because actually the Italians were quite close and quite also in terms of language and ethnicity to the Occitans, to the southern French, uh, rather than the northern French that are that are really the ones who eventually made it into the, the French kingdom. Um, <coughs> because those were the lands of Francia proper, where the Franks had settled. Occitania, uh, <coughs> say southern France, was um, something historically very different. Uh, we will see today how during the 13th century um <coughs> the uh, the northern french uh, practically um uh, conquered um once for all the uh <coughs> this uh, the occitans and um framed them mm, forever into their uh, royal institution uh, uh, into their royal mm, domains um <coughs> excuse me a drink a little <coughs> Okay. <coughs> um, but relatively to Italy, the famous uh, Sicilian mm, poetry, Tuscan literature, uh, were all of French, uh, Provencal, say better, um <coughs> derivation, and even uh, in the times of Dante, that eventually brought uh, Italian vernacular to the peaks of of, of medieval of medieval literature, um, great part of the Italians used to read and write, uh, especially in narrative and literature, into is ex essentially copying the uh, copying the French. Uh, I mean, this statement should be a bit right already mentioned because the Italians used to write either in Latin or in vernacular already at the time. But the literary models, um, the ones of poetry, did. Uh, chivalric epics and all were definitely French, and uh, at that time even the northern French models were flowing into Italy. Um, uh, chivalry, in, in this sense, and knighthood were definitely a French thing. The imperial knights, the German knights, were also very praised for their qualities um, during uh, and, and, and rose during the 13th and 14th century to <coughs> actually a very high level of quality recognized um, all over Europe, we're still looking at France as the true knightly model. And, um, I mean, France was so huge in this sense. And by the way, as we will see today, what really characterizes France, because this is really the, the true thing, it's not a national identity, it's not a common language, it's not a not even a common kingdom in this sense, but it is before the kingdom in itself, because that comes later, it is the monarchy. France is the monarchy, the French monarchy, and this is something that is born exactly into the thirteenth century. This is also another statement that uh, should be rightly mentioned because people said but well France as Francia, let's say, was born de facto with uh, Clovis and the Merovingians back in the in the sixth uh, century. Um, this is um, true. Uh, indeed, there is a continuity existing between the Merovingian and Carolingian Francia into uh, eventually what became mm, Capetian France. Uh, and and eventually also the, the Valois and, and all the um, you know uh, all you know the, the monarchy of of, mm, of France as we know it in modern age and, and the Bourbon and all. But um, <coughs> it is true, however, that before this 13th century, today we will explain it, the Kingdom of France could as well uh, be aborted. Um, which would have not been at all something strange. This is something that had happened also to other post carolingian kingdoms that could theoretically have a future. It is true that the French kingdom in, in this sense 
I'd say better, Western Frankish Kingdom, because before the 13th century, the, the Kingdom of France was actually named not as Regnum France, but as um, Kingdom of Western Franks, because theoretically, the, even the imperial ideals were, were still there. We know that the um, the Capetians eventually built up France as if it was a sort of parallel empire. Um, but I it's evident that while Italy was re um, t uh, tied to, to Germany with the Renovatio in Imperi and therefore the Holy Roman Empire as this um, German-Italian axis was born, uh, <coughs> France was something on its own. And theoretically it wasn't so because the, the empire um, in the West had technically to be uh, the, uh, the sovereign ruler of all, at least the Western uh, Christians. So theoretically also the French Kingdom was a feudal possession of the Holy Roman Emperor. But the Kingdom of France was so powerful in its own that <laughs> it was actually stronger than the, especially uh, from 13th century onwards to the, um, to the German King. Um, and in this sense, um, they always did whatever they, they, they liked. And um, in this sense, it's also very fascinating to look at the relations between uh, the, the French and the papacy compared to the one between the, the, the emperors and the papacy, and to spot actually an a, a stronger and more solid alliance which was which was intermittent anyway, so it wasn't something. But it was historical. It was felt between the the French king and uh, and Rome, um, the Roman Church, uh, exactly an anti-German function. I mean, the, the Guelph system that was created in Europe essentially at, at, at during the 12th and especially in 13th century. So this French papal axis against um, against the German emperors and. As you know, Germany wasn't a unitary thing. Uh, I mean, the, even the German emperors had very mm, few concrete power, considering the whole uh, extension of the Holy Roman Empire. And even in Germany, it was like they, they controlled a, at best a half of the kingdom um, in the moments of the uh, greater uh, of apex uh, of the apex, let's say. Um, <coughs> well, the French remain in this sense as the most chivalric um, kingdom uh, in Europe, also the most Catholic one. Many people say, well, that was um, Spain. Well, Spain, yes, Spain built a its own identity on Christianity <coughs> through the Reconquista, but really the, the champions of of Christianism were considered the French simply because that was all one thing with being the uh, the champions of knighthood. Mm. So even the Italians were Catholic, even Germans were Catholic, but um, the idea was that um, the greater um, power that existed at the time on earth was put there essentially by by God so even this was very important because when especially the um, <coughs> uh, the Holy Roman Imperial power collapsed at the in the mid of the 13th century objectively the France was uh, first of all the only uh, the greatest power in Europe but it wasn't just the greatest one in relative terms it was also a huge monstrous power and today we'll see how this power was really built. So study French history because it is really fascinating. So uh, recently I made a video about um, the destroy. I, I called it something like uh, from Henry uh, the Sixth to Bouvine, the struggle for the empire. That mm, in a certain sense uh, is a bit the con uh, the previous part of of, let's say, today's video is it's going to be relatively a continuation of it from the French perspective because it ends with Bouvine um, uh, and today we start again with Bouvine so if you look at, if you if you watch that video you understand what, what we're talking about maybe a little better but I think Bouvine has not to be introduced even if not with just a few data Bouvine <coughs> 12th 
14 was um, simply the most important battle of the Middle Ages. Um, um, uh, it, it was um, well. The the story is it, it, it's 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 very famous. It was French victory over the the Anglo uh, <coughs> German alliance of uh, John Lackland and Otto of Brunswick. Um, uh, the, f the French king Philip II uh, Augustus called in this way uh, exactly because he gave back to France a, a huge power in European affairs, um, defeated essentially the um, the Guelph bloc that was existing in, in Europe, uh, was represented by the Saxons of Otto de Brunswick that were backed in turn by the English, and basically in in a very few, like in a, in a decade, it won back uh, almost all of France um, from, from the English, who had uh, at that point through their Angevin feudal possessions actually occupied a, m a, a much larger land uh, than the one over which the same French king ruled and essentially the French king took the opportunity to uh, to absorb all this um, uh, all these territories so this was, was a huge um, accomplishment what you, you what you see is essentially the collapse of English presence into uh, into France. Um, it's it wasn't really English in the sense that the the uh, the English monarch in this sense was essentially a a Norman uh, derived at least a French derived. I mean the the, the court spoke French. There was uh, th it's not that there had been the English on the French soil as the, you know. The as if it was a national possession. It, it, it was just a matter of feudal inheritance of French lands, also very diverse ones, because uh, if you take Aquitaine, that had been brought by Eleanor uh, at the time of Henry VII, um <coughs> and she eventually married the, uh, the, the, the English king and brought that as a dowry. Um, was Occitan, it was part of those um, of those lands that in this sense were very different from the ones of northern France. But the, the Kingdom of France did exist as such, I mean in terms of political and juridical um, uh, matters, uh, in feudal Europe there was the King of Western France that had a more or less mm, mm, defined uh, extension, borders and all. Uh, <coughs> the problem is that the, the Capetian dynasty that rose to power to 987 from um, following to the essentially the rule of the Counts of Paris that had um, taken rise into power at the end of the uh, with the extinction of the Carolingians um, had been a relatively weak dynasty. Um, not because they were weak as um, such. I mean the Ile de France was pretty well uh, ruled by the Capetians since an early age, but the, the real problem was all the other French vassals that most of the times were even more powerful than and than the French king uh, himself. Think about the the Normans that had conquered England, so they were technically vassals of the French king as dukes of Normandy, but they were English um, uh, English kings uh, for having conquered. Uh, England, all by themselves, essentially. Um, but there were also other very powerful um, um, feudal lords into France that had a, mm, a very large degree of autonomy, um, simply because there was no way in this feudal Europe to, to, to centralize before having reached a certain degree of power. So the Capetians were recognized actually as French kings. Um, this is also peculiar characteristics of feudal Europe. It's not that those uh, uh, people who fought against uh, the emperors or the kings um, didn't recognize the um, imperial or royal institution. They did. But it was exactly on that base that they claimed that this or that um, sovereign was not um, was not fit to rule, um, that he had to be deposed. You think of all the <coughs> political 
gaming that went on in this sense with, I don't know, the Popple interference, all the local um, intrigues and um, political balances and all that. I mean, si to, to make a synthesis of all these um, schemes, it, it, it's it's impossible during the feudal age. And and every kingdom um, in this sense figured as such, but uh, as a sort of unitary thing. But as a matter of fact, it wasn't. And feudalism de definitely gave a hand to to, to this mm, chaos because from one side, uh, feudalism was a bit double-edged in terms of centralization because objectively it's a decentralized uh, government because. Basically, there is a public land that is, however, entrusted by the king to certain vassals that, uh, even though on, on, on the king's behalf, de facto rule mm, autonomously when not independently um, in their own lands. And this is truer, especially if you look at in the French case, took it southern France that, that was basically doing what, whatever they wanted without even being too much too much concerned about what the French king said because um, of course he could use certain political weapons against them but it, it was objectively I mean the, the the range of its political and military power didn't go much f much beyond the the, the France uh, geographically so um, what would the <laughs> I mean the southern French had greater problems than the king of France at, at, at a certain at a certain point. Um, and they were continuously pushing for uh, autonomy. Mm. I mean, this is something you find even in the Kingdom of England. The Kingdom of England was relatively more compact, uh, geographically speaking, also smaller. Uh, it had other mm, dynamics that, um, you know, but it was still a, a feudal kingdom, and after the, battle of the defeat of Vuvin, you, you see that what, what the Magna Carta and, and eventually with the other constitutions that were emanated by the kings uh, on the barons, uh, at the barons' request, you see that it was a, a essentially mm, the, the nobility was pursuing um, nothing but an autonomization from uh, the central uh, royal central power, uh, essentially. So this had been also the case of France. Um, the Ile de France, fortunately for the Capetians, was an extremely fertile territory. Uh, it has a, uh, a very peculiar soil. Uh, it didn't help just in agriculture and in creating lots of, of, of agricultural surpri surplus, but also it had very important um, caves that, I mean, all the beautiful French cathedrals that you can find in northern France uh, uh, are actually built with this particular um, um, a type of rocks that exist in there that also were quite important in term in artistical in architectural and artistical terms for the development of gothic uh, art that went uh, in parallel actually with the development of the French monarchy because actually the French uh, sovereigns were mm, quite um, uh, were em emphasizing their own um, uh, their own political prerogatives together with their um, <coughs> um, holiness, essentially. We will see it at the end of the video. They were claiming that uh, they were the most catholic, uh, um, uh, most, f um, let's say, the most faithful um, uh, sovereigns to, to the Church of Rome, and um, the uh, gothic cathedrals that they made built were were mm, aimed at representing this universal order, um, obviously conceived in Christian terms that had to be all one with their their own um, <coughs> model of um, of um, of earthly power as kings of France. Um, very complicated things, but also very fascinating if you if you have any interest. Um, um, in the, there is all a beautiful literature about this. Um, I wanted to find. I don't know if I can find you that beautiful um, book that exists in French cathedrals that you should be able to find uh, online. Ah, yes, it should be. Um, 
um, Otto Georg von Simpson, The Gothic Cathedral, Origins of Gothic Architecture and the Medieval Concept of Order. It's a beautiful book you can find easily online um, for free in PDF. And if you read that, you understand what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm surely going to dedicate a, a video to, to, to this. But uh, what is important, going back to, to Bouvin, is, is really the, um, the symbolic victory uh, that went together with the uh, very, mm, in parallel with the very fast spread of French political and military rule over Western Europe. Because the Battle of Bouvin was essentially the triumph of the feudal system, of chivalry, and of, in general, of, of a social political model that was embodied by the Kingdom of France. The Kingdom of France was the most feudalized of all, so the spread of the French um, uh, power went in parallel with the feudalization of many uh, parts of, um, of, of, um, of Europe, actually, because um, not just through the French direct power that definitely extended, for instance, in, in southern France, where feudalism did exist, but it wasn't um, of the same um, intensity uh, like in the northern France. In instead, the, 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 the Capetians brought to a sort of refeudalization of the southern uh, French lands. But it went also beyond, because um, in, in this sense, the French uh, institutional model made school into other countries. Uh, Germany was very heavily influenced by French feudalism at this time because the feudal institutions were still developing uh, in Germany and they, they weren't so developed like in France. Um, as we've seen, the literary models that flowed uh, um, you know, into Italy, into Spain, and, and uh, etc. Uh, even German Minnesänger were inspired to the French uh, models. Um, the um, so feudalism, as as we were saying, also as a, as a social political model, like a, a feudal hierarchy with a king at the top that controlled um, the state. Uh, in the sense, the church. This was also a very important thing because the kingdom of France, in this sense, arrived, especially at the end of the 13th century, beginning of 14th, to claim certain prerogatives. Um, um, over the, the control of the local French church and even mm, building a sort of theology of, of um, a royal theology. I mean, the idea that um, just like the Holy Roman Emperors had been doing, um, that the idea that the French king was um, had um, not just earthly prerogatives as king of France, but also certain spiritual ones over his church. So this brought eventually to attrition with with the uh, with papacy. Think of Boniface VIII and the clash with with Philip IV, the fair. Um, um, the um, so um, the really the construction of of, a, of an extremely solid political theory revolving around the Kingdom of France. Feudalism that goes in parallel, um, w therefore, with the um, pre preeminence of the feudal aristocracy over the all the other social classes. So, during the expansion of the French kingdom, there is also the, uh, uh, in parallel, the um, uh, the the uh, deadening, in, in or at least the. the um, the shrinking of, of certain local autonomies that existed, um, like certain urban centers were mm, progressively more uh, subjected to the, f the local feudal lords and all. This is not completely true in all, mm, in all moments because at all moments because, for instance, the same French um, kings um, d mm, granted certain rights, for instance, to, to certain northern French uh, cities to counter the local bishops' powers uh, in order to eventually expand in turn over them. So it wasn't something done um, uh, to uh, the benefit or, or of this or that community, but it was just uh, essentially a, a rebalancement of power to avoid that certain um, 
uh, lords, um, certain uh, uh, feudatories would grow uh, excessively, excessively power and could mm, constitute a threat to the same um, to the same monarchy. Um, it was also the, in this sense, the preeminence of um, uh, the defi definitive dominance of uh, heavy feudal heavy cavalry over the battlefield. So the 13th century, although there is in parallel uh, to the rise of France and other feudal powers, also the rise of cities in many areas in, in of of, um, uh, of Europe, it also pretty close to France, like for instance in the Flanders, where eventually the French uh, tried to expand. Um, there was definitely the um, the lack of uh, infantry victories over the feudal uh, cavalry. I mean, the 13th, while during the, the 11th and the 12th century, the uh, feudalism uh, uh, was on the rise, and heavy cavalry could still meet certain, uh, um, let's say, stubborn and 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 resolute um, infantries that could withstand their charges during the 13th century. There is the peak um, in every sense, um, even technological, uh, technologically speaking, of the heavy cavalry uh, on the European battlefields. And uh, this is the moment in which sometimes, you, you in the major battles uh, of the time, you understand that, that the infantry um, had a very uh, a very small role, um, especially in the feudal armies, um, and sometimes it wasn't even named from the sources of these battles. And uh, this is the uh, the century of also of, of greater development of chival of um, of uh, heavy cavalry tactics that actually were um, uh, were uh, were actually developing uh, against the chivalric ideals because there were feints, ambushes, flank attacks that were all but um, let's say in this mm, chivalric ethics, mm, all but chivalric in fact, <laughs> because they were considered to be uh, disloyal, unloyal practically. Um, but at the same time, it proves how you know developed and, and more sophisticated cavalry tactics were growing. Uh, so that after the 13th century, basically nothing more is added, even in the rest of the uh, Middle Ages, to cavalry tactics. Instead, there is, uh, especially from the 14th century onwards, a, s a rise of the infantry once again. Um, so this was really the victory of a model that was born in France with the Frankish, uh, within the Frankish society, and had therefore expanded all over Europe. Basically, from France. Um, derives all the feudalism that spread everywhere. I mean, uh, during the 13th century, all Western Europe was feudal in practice, because England was feudal. Scotland was essentially, especially with after, was was slowly, um, actually fastly growing during the 13th century in economical terms, and this brought to the increase of certain clans and rules that, in this sense, ruled in a more um uh, starting to, to to rule over Scotland that was really divided but at least from from a higher uh, a progressively higher position the the Spanish reconquista that in the 13th century especially with the battle of Na Las Navas conquered to one to the Christians most of, of the Iberian Peninsula definitely went in parallel with expansion of feudalism Castile was the, the main feudal mm, kingdom, uh, and also the most powerful one, the same name derives from castle, so you understand that feudalism was pretty much there. Um, that was spreading also in Portugal, also in Aragon, um, uh, in, um, uh, which were lands, by the way, that had been already Francized since centuries, but this is the, the center into which France is emanating influence that is able to to shape uh, to shape in continuously in a continu in um let's say in an increasingly um, um, uh, faster ways the local political institutions towards a, a feudal model Italy um, Italy is not getting particularly feudalized but say the the, the city 
uh, on the contrary, the, the cities are on the rise, but even the urban classes uh, of Italy are growing as um, as extremely fascinated with um, the French courtly models. Uh, there are definitely knights in Italian cities and in the countryside that are living, let's say, in the French fashion. There is also a lot of, especially during the second half of the 13th century with the the French conquest of the um, Kingdom of Sicily, there is a very strong, uh, uh, especially Provencal, influence into the uh, cities of uh, northern and central Italy um, in terms of chivalric models, even of uh, um, uh, military equipment styles that we call sometimes um, Tasco Provencal, just to tell you how strong it was, and that's that's the moment into which the Italians uh, are literally in love with French literature. Uh, in Germany, as we've seen um, from the time of um, Frederick Barbarossa, that was the one that imported the, um, into Germany the feudalism of French, um, um, a French model. Essentially, is slowly, uh, mm, you know, expanding all over Germany. Let's say that feudalism in Germany spreads together with the um, um, uh, claiming of the as one p areas of the forest stations i mean where the also the um, um management um and um and land organization models of of typical feudalism can be materially um uh, exported in, in to certain lands that before were relatively wilder and in turn bohemia uh is uh, very strongly um tr tr mm, um I is um uh, is being f increasingly feudalized through these uh, German but in turn French models. The same goes for Western Poland. Uh, the Scandinavian, um, the Scandinavian kingdoms are getting finally fully feudalized. In the 13th century in into into Scandinavia is the say the, the final stage of this process, very long process of feudalization that had been tougher in Scandinavia because uh, it was a, a poorer mm, land and th there weren't even the the, the material mm, possibilities up to a certain point to, to build up this large powerful um, um, uh, lordships based on, as on, on, on agriculture and land estates and so on. So you understand that basically f the, from France um, it this this feudal um, model expands successfully all over Western Europe, and it kind of becomes characteristics in this sense. Uh, even hung the Hungarians at this time, especially with the collapse of the Byzantine Empire um, in at the beginning of the thirteenth century, uh, um, are mm, increasingly growing increasingly um, uh, close to the uh, Western political models. The Byzantine Empire collapses, I was about to forget. Uh, in 1204, the French, together with the Venetians, conquer Constantinople and create the Latin Empire of, uh, of the East, that is essentially a French-dominated um, uh, land in Greece, and, uh, mm, uh, and uh, there are French lords into, into Greece at that time ruling. Uh, during the 13th century, telling the truth, there is the uh, the final, um, um, let's say, um, stage of the uh, Crusades that, as we will see, will be very important. Um, I mean, the major Crusades had been the ones of the, of the, of the 11th and, and, and 12th century, but even during the 13th, there were very big expeditions mounted by the French together with other Europeans to win back uh, Jerusalem from from the Muslims and uh, they failed but there were anyway huge expeditions and in this sense are very important to analyze so really a great um, and, and this goes accordingly in parallel with the economical expansion of Europe because um, feudalism is something that um, exists as long as there is a very exceeding surplus that allows the elites to, to be maintained uh, uh, in their mm, feudal lifestyle at the top, which was extremely expensive. So um, 
uh, in this sense, during 13th century, Europe is uh, is mm, rising very, very, very fast, economically speaking, and the elites are mm, of, of the uh, you know, the, um, let's say the local lordships were already largely feudal before the 13th century, but in this sense they are able to to accumulate in an increasing amount of, of, of power. Excuse me, and drink a little once again. So, um, it's really the triumph of feudalism uh, of many ways. So with the Battle of Bovin, um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the Angevins of England um, regress uh, quite strongly. And, um, and this is a very important moment in the, um, really in the uh, development of the same um, political and territorial organization of the English and French monarchies. Um, because up to that point, we've seen that the 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 the, the Angevin uh, 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 Empire, that is sometimes called in this way of England, had been you know half in England and half in France, essentially spreading. Uh, at this point, it said, as we've seen, the English lose France uh, ten f f f up to you know the the, the Hundred Years' War. Um, when they try it back, but it, the, uh, by that time the French uh, are the French monarchy is is much stronger, um, much strongly rooted in into France, and even if the, it it, it collapsed uh, at one point once again, eventually it was able to 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 win back France from the English, exactly because of the structures that it had been able to build. What I for I was forgetting to say is that. Um, uh, without the the, um, the Battle of Bouvines, uh, it might have well been that um, the Kingdom of France would have would have not existed as we know it. I mean, it, it might have been um, it might have remained uh, definitely in feudal terms as this uh, entity. Like I don't know, there was an Italian kingdom at this time, but uh, there was no. Um, you know, nothing in central northern Italy that resembled a, a kingdom in practice. Um, if not German um, sovereigns coming a every once in a while and claiming the, uh, you know, the, the, the Italian crown and uh, but eventually having to fight all their, all their lives trying to curb the local communities because that, that absolutely didn't, uh, didn't want uh, a um, you know other people minding their own um, uh, their own business, um, so they um, the the king of France uh, w without Bouvin might have well not existed, and um, this is why it is so important. It, it was it has been the greatest battle of the Middle Ages. Um, the um, the the victory between in this sense instead clearly shaped um, a mm, um, uh, uh, a political the political map of Europe with a kingdom of a solid kingdom of France into this area of mm, central Western Europe and the kingdom of England into Britain and the um, the um, um, and 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 there is definitely the increase of homogeneity into um, uh, into the French kingdom as a um, as a political uh, entity. Um, the um, this the descendants of Philip the Second Augustus managed, in fact, to extend, as we have seen, the the French. Uh, authority the, the the French royal authority all over the uh, the kingdom very important very importantly Philip the second Augustus among all the other uh, things in terms of uh, um, administrative reforms and um, and all um, was the first one that called uh, that the that, that named uh, the Western Frankish kingdom as kingdom of France up to that point it had been Western Frankish Kingdom, like Germany was the Eastern Frankish Kingdom. It was a name that had 
remained essentially since the, uh, part in the, in the partition of the Carolingian Empire. From that time on, France was Regnum Franche, uh, uh, Royaume de France in French. So, uh, a true, um, a true French uh, kingdom uh, in the uh, national, proto-national sense of the term. That was a very important thing to claim because it wasn't saying, you know, we are part of something else, um, of the old empire. We, no, we are something on our own. We are French. And this is very interesting because it, it was really showing that France didn't want to be subjected to the, um, to the Germans. Definitely Germans couldn't at all um, extend their powers on France at this time, but it was very important, ideologically speaking, to stress this, because technically the Kingdom of France was still part of the Holy Roman Empire, but you never find it on, on, on a political map of, uh, of Europe at the time, because I, I, in modern terms we like to represent, um, you know, uh, this kind of compact uh, colors corresponding similarly to, to the one of the 19th uh, century national states, but as a matter of fact, th th this wasn't the truth. When you see the Holy Roman Empire, sometimes like a unique block extending fr si from mm, from from Denmark to to central Italy, and that is that is not an accurate representation of what that really was. There was a a cluster of uh, hundreds uh, of uh, uh, principalities and city states that had no almost no cohesive um meaning uh, in 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 concrete political po political terms france he said was something really compact on its own and was in this sense able even to play on the um on the holy roman imperial divisions we have seen that the battle of Bovin was essentially a fight between um uh, was a decisive battle for uh, claim uh, for um, determining who between Otto of Brunswick and Frederick II of Wallenstaufen would rise to the imperial throne. The French, um, si since especially the uh, the collapse of the Wallenstaufen power um, during the uh, the second half of the, of the uh, 13th century, um, 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 enter very uh, prominently into uh, Italian affairs. So they are able to play. Very uh, and to intervene also in favor of the Guelph Italians against the Ghibelline Italians that instead were backed by the uh, the Germans. So they um, this um, the idea that uh, the empire at that point was something the French could even uh, interfere in really gives you the dimension of how France was powerful and more unitary compared uh, compared to. Uh, to to Germany that was uh, especially after the fall of the Ostrogoths and a an extremely divided and and weak entity as 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 such so the um obviously there were also in France i mean we we don't have to think of France either as as a monolithic entity uh, but definitely for those time standards it was one of the of the most solid domains that you could you could actually find um, Louis uh, the uh, the eight uh, French king uh, who ruled between 1223 um, and uh, 1226, so just after Philip II, um, uh, imposed his rule over the lords of the Languedoc, so his uh, southern French uh, Occitan region. Um, and uh, and this was the time to which, by the way, the Albigensian Crusade started. The Albigensian Crusade started actually during Philip II's rule, um, in uh, together with um, uh, you know it was essentially a, a, a French papal um, uh, military expedition against the uh, uh, the Occitan nobility of the south. Aside from the religious, uh, the religious problems, this was um, the, the the crusade started uh, against the Catars um, uh, in uh, in a moment into which Philip was still uh, engulfed into the um, war against the English, and Philip w did a very clever thing. So he um, uh, he he didn't like his vassals, his, as we've seen. The French vassals were pretty. Um, uh, hostile to the idea of even 
having the the the, the king uh, rising uh, to excessive power that could eventually interfere in their own business. So Philip thought something very clever. First of all, these vassals were usually, you know, th the feudal system was born chiefly for military reasons. Uh, these vassals had owed to the king certain military service, and military service is a universally <laughs> extremely expensive thing. So they didn't want to help Philip against the English, uh, not just for the expense, but, but also for the aforementioned reasons that they didn't want the French king to grow too powerful, as Philip was growing, especially after Bouvin, as we've seen. So Philip thought something very clever. He decided to, uh, together with the Pope, to launch this crusade in the south of France, sending in there the French vassals and telling them, seize what you want. Um, so these French vassals were quite eager uh, um, doing that because they, they could seize new lands, but the Fran the he Philip knew that it was a very tough war that would have taken place in the south of France, so basically if you take even Simon de Montfort, he spent uh, years and years fighting in, in Occitane, and e he even died in there. Um, actually, the, the 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 Crusaders uh, mm, did. Uh, I mean, did w especially with the death of Simon de Montfort, basically all the efforts of the Albigensian Crusade went went lost because the uh, his uh, personal power into Occitane. Um, basically vanished mm, together with even with the control that French monarchy could exercise through Simon. So um, basically these French vassals um, uh, sp um, spilled a lot of blood ultimately for, for nothing, but they also sensibly weakened the local Occitan nobility. At the same time, Philip was instead fighting against the English with mercenaries that, uh, contrarily wise to stereotype, were uh, since Philip was decently wealthy at this time, uh, were quite faithful to him, or at least to his money, <laughs> let's say, and he accomplished that extraordinary feat of winning back Normandy and uh, Poitou and all those regions of of, Fran of north and, and central f uh, France to, to the crown. And it was, however, under um, Louis uh, the Ninth, uh, one of the greatest kings of France, in that ruled after Louis the Eighth, from 1226 to uh, uh, 1270, very long reign. That, in, in especially in 1233, um, the French crown uh, managed finally uh, finally managed to expand over the uh, county of Toulouse, which was the the major. Um, Occitan power uh, at the time, a very solid and very also well-structured uh, political entity that, however, was um, was eventually that eventually passed actually for um, dynastic and through dynastic um, uh, marriages um, to uh, to the same uh, uh, Louis the Ninth. Uh, with the peace of of Paris of of, twil uh, of 1259, Louis IX at this time also completed the um, the acquisition of Poitou, of Anjou and Aquitaine, where um, you know th there have been some um, you know op still some opposition to to the French uh, king's rule. Um, and where the English had kept backing the, the local nobility against against the, the Capetians. Um, the um, so this is essentially when, with the Peace of, pa of Paris of 1259, there is the 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 great there is the end of of this great um, series of wars of um, of conflicts with the. Um, with the English ruler for the control of, of France. Um, later, um, especially during the Ninth, there are these um, there is uh, an expansion of, of the French kingdom towards the Mediterranean, because the French at this time didn't have a, uh, a port on the Mediterranean, uh, and they needed that for crusades. So instead of passing through Genoa and other Italian cities that had their own, that had its own coast, Louis IX thought of building a, a French port in the southern uh, shores of uh, of France. Um, Aigues mm, I was there. It's a beautiful place. And there is still this magnificent 
uh, it's not really a castle, it's, it's like a huge fortified perimeter, but that was um, a very important base from which Louis, by the way, launched the um, uh, the two um, crusades that he uh, unsuccessful crusades once uh, one and the first one against Egypt who that culminated into disaster um, um, but it, it was very promising because at this point the French I mean Louis the Knight was uh, known as Louis the Saint so um, the, 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 f the French uh, monarchy had developed this very stern very um, uh, char um, character, especially in religious terms, they were quite pious. They they they, they sensed the, the moral weight of their um, the moral responsibility of their role, uh, also in relation with the, to the church and um, uh, and and he, Louis the Knight was um, was a very active crusader. He um, uh, uh, invested these huge resources for in these two expeditions, and the the, the 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 objective was seizing Jerusalem, but not attacking directly to Palestine. Um, Palestine had, um, but essentially attacking Egypt first because um, um, Jerusalem was owned by by the Egyptians at this time. So the idea was, if you if I conquer if we conquer Egypt. Basically, the whole uh, Egyptian um, rule will collapse also in Jerusalem, and we will uh, be able to seize it, and, in, and plus knocking out this major mm, northern African and near eastern power that is um, um, uh, that could create other problems like it had been in the past. I mean, Jerusalem had been won back by after mm, centuries of struggle between the, the Crusaders, the Kingdom of Jerusalem, and and the uh, and the Egyptian kingdom, um, and it's that the actually the, the, the cru w what it's important with these um, crusades is that uh, there were pretty mm, considerable expeditions. I mean, logistically speaking, it was an incredible effort, and even militarily speaking, I mean, the French were, uh, as we have seen, at the peak of. Um, of military efficiency, not just uh, in, in their own history, but uh, they were the best. They had the best armies in, in, in Europe at the time. So when they arrived in Egypt, they, they managed to accomplish initially something. Eventually, the word the century, the, the Egyptians carried out a scorched land um, uh, policy. They uh, and, and basically the whole expedition collapsed, even Louis the Knight was basically obliged to leave wh while he, he was an extremely courageous knight, he wanted to fight uh, uh, and, and die essentially with his own uh, uh, French knights, uh, but uh, he was told, look, m your majesty, if you die, that, that's going to be a huge blow for France and a, and a and a pity, he also increased in terms in this sense, so he, he left. Then eventually Louis died in uh, he, in the following expedition that he organized um, uh, uh, once again in the, in the same fashion, which was a huge expedition, much larger. Uh, the, the Aragonese also participated with like 20,000 men. Uh, the English sent a, a, a huge amount of forces. I mean, it was probably the largest uh, crusader expedition that had been ever um, mounted. Uh, this in 1270. Uh, at this time, um, th the idea was that the, um, um, uh, the crusaders had to stop in Tunisia. That was also pretty close to Sicily, that was controlled at the time by um, the um, Charles of Charles of Anjou, uh, a Neapolitan king that was incidentally uh, Louis's brother. But uh, an epidemic uh, 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 broke out also in, in Tunisia, and uh, Louis and also his son and, and, and others. Um, uh, and other members of the courts uh, died in there. So uh, this uh, expedition was aborted. It was a disastrous enterprise. The French had to retreat to old through Italy, and they didn't have the money to pay there for their passage. So they basically uh, paid with the bones of uh, the poor uh, Louis the Ninth because he was considered saint already at that time. So in Italy, you find all over the peninsula, lots of churches that all have a piece of uh, a bone of, of Saint uh, Louis. Um, 
because of this reason and you know that uh, at the time when especially people died in summer uh, these very important uh, characters died in summer in very hot lands especially during crusades um, their corpses were boiled so on that only the uh, the uh, usually the the, mm, the heart was extracted before boiling the body and then eventually he was boiled and, and the bones were kept. This had happened also with Frederick Barbarossa when he had died in Turkey. Um, uh, sounds pretty macabre but it was really important at the time also because there weren't many ways to preserve uh, bodies in certain environmental conditions. Um, so that was um, a very heavy blow for France, but it was still a, a, a such an enormous power that it kept uh, expanding in spite of that. Um, so the, when the eventually the um, in 1291 the uh, the Crusader states were con uh, conquered by uh, the Muslims with the fall of Acre in uh, uh, in that year. Uh, the French uh, and the Europeans in general abandoned the idea of crusade. Uh, they understood, they, they learned the art way that it was tough to expand into the East. They preferred to act diplomatically speaking with other powers that could maybe intervene against uh, the Egyptians, uh, even the Mongols. Um, there is a, actually a renewed interest um, from the Europeans to, towards uh, towards the Muslims. Also in cultural terms, there were lots of novels into which figures like Saladin appear in positive terms and all. So it was a, a moment into which really universalism was about to die, um, and into which the rise of national monarchies in this sense was playing an increasingly uh, secular um, uh, role uh, and uh, the other major French um, uh, uh, r direction of um, expansion direction and uh, direction uh, at this point was the Flanders. This happened uh, with Philip the Fort, also known as Philip the Fair, also one of the other one of the greatest French monarchs of the time, ruled from. Uh, 1285 to 1314, uh, um, that um, uh, um, that began to expand towards the Flanders. Uh, the reason was kind of natural. This is actually a direction that French uh, expansionism took um, 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 very. Um, uh, lots of other times in history, if you look at. Uh, er, let's say ever since France was unified, um, uh, um, it took that direction in in into into what was actually the northwestern part of the Holy Roman Empire. I mean, um, in the 14th century, um, uh, France was eventually engulfed with the uh, the Hundred Years' War, and it was busy at fighting the English under on its own soil. So it abandoned the situation. But in in after the the end of the Hundred Years' War, France expanded into um, uh, it, it. It basically um, reunified the whole kingdom, kind of did what uh, it had done in the 13th century by uh, re um, reacquiring all the uh, lands that had been occupied by the English. And at that point, as a unified kingdom and uh, as a very advanced one, once again in political and military terms, invaded Italy. But also the Flanders, so fighting against the uh, the Holy Roman Emperors, the Habsburgs at the time to towards that direction. Then during the, uh, the 16th century, uh, they lose essentially the fight, the the war against the Habsburgs of Spain and Austria, and and France gets once ag uh, once again uh, implodes once again and gets engulfed with the wars of French uh, the, fr uh, the French wars of religion against the Huguenots and all. But once that France gets once again unified and Louis the uh, the the fourteenth um, begins to build finally uh, once again most advanced forms of. Uh, uh, political forms in Europe with uh, the creation of the French modern state, where does it get invading? <laughs> into Italy and into the Flanders once again. 
The, the reason from the for this French uh, attraction, let's say, towards the Flanders are evident because they were some of the most advanced uh, regions in, in Europe at the time, some of the wealthiest, actually, and uh, politically divided because they were all urban um, centers that, uh, yeah, that was a French um, um, and and the Holy Roman Imperial um, uh, feudal, um, say, dominance formally, but these these cities were essentially developing as autonomous city-states. Um, and, um, and, and, and telling the truth, the county of Flanders was still part of France. I mean, the county of Flanders was one of the historical regions of the French kingdom, so the Flanders actually uh, were uh, were a frontier land between France and, and Germany, that into which there were many uh, in interactions from from all sides, many intersections, also in this sense, um, and 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 they had remained relatively autonomous from from French monarchy up to that point. So um, the the French kings didn't like at all the Flemish autonomistic and and and. Uh, pro-English uh, uh, pushes, um, they, um, um, and, 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 the, uh, and the English were actively backing the, uh, the Flemish against uh, the, uh, the, uh, the French uh, for obvious reasons, you know, England and, and Flanders were quite strongly tied at this time for, think about all the wool exports that England had historically into the um, uh, Flemish textile industries and all. Uh, so th this axis was actually would would become really the um, the reason for the main reason for the uh, the Hundred Years War that it was a dynastic uh, uh, conflict, but it had in this sense much greater economical implications. So uh, the um, the the expansion of the um, the French uh, uh, monarchy went in parallel, as we were saying, with the um, um, the strengthening of um, the uh, f uh, of the king's sovereignty all, all over the French territory. Um, in feudal fashion, it uh, required the uh, homage uh, that the vassal had to. Uh, uh, perform in front of the king, um, and, um, and and which in turn had to be given by all the other uh, sub vassals, minor vassals, and other lords that existed in in the kingdom. Um, the French king was controlling the um, uh, also those um, fiefs that had remained uh, vacant. Um, because of the extinction, maybe of the local uh, uh, lineage, or mm, for for other uh, uh, for other dynamics that it could happen really at the time, um, and uh, and especially the uh, feudal transitions into into France um, uh, entailed the payment of a tax to the crown, mm, so. Uh, these means were progressively uh, strengthened and developed to to favor the incomes of the of the king. Uh, these were all. This is how really the mm, the centralization mm, operated. If you hear people say that in the Middle Ages there was no centralization, that in feudal Europe everything was decentralized, know that that person is a liar because there has never been a single uh, society that hasn't had a degree of centralization. And this is the moment in 13th century France, so in the very heart of the Middle Ages, into which centralization ma starts to make its um, more consistent steps in the feudal world. Um, the uh, the uh, the king had the French king uh, had the full um, legislative um, power uh, authority, and uh, the French kings uh, also began to establish these territorial officials like the bailiffs in the north and the siniscalx uh, in in the south. There were essentially mm, royal agents, um, 
Um, and uh, the French monarch also exercised the f uh, his full authority in um, the jurisdictional field and over the entire uh, the entire kingdom. Um, relatively to the mm, central uh, political administrative institutions, uh, under Louis VIII and Louis IX, there was the consolidation of the government uh, governmental apparatus. And uh, first of all, the uh, administration of financiary, uh, financial resources was entrusted to the uh, royal treasury, while um, uh, to the parliament were entrusted the uh, judiciary, uh, ju judiciary functions. Uh, um, however, the, uh, the first great jurisdiction uh, was a, uh, a king, prerog uh, a royal prerogative, um and uh while the um um uh the uh how do you say that oh, wait a second uh, the um the plea ah yeah of course the the the, uh, the appeal calls and the pleas um for uh the uh, sentences promulgated by our tribunals also were could could mm, were um, accepted by by uh, the French monarch, and he could also intervene in these uh, um, you know um, juridical matters. You have to think that uh, w in the Middle Ages and also in other times in history, whoever exercised law um, um, ha um, had also parts uh, of the incomes deriving from you know the uh, the fines, um, the confiscations, and all, because that was meant uh, as a remuneration for the um, um, for administrating justice. Mm -hmm. So, um, having um, uh, these uh, juridical prerogatives uh, also equated to have further incomes. So that that's why the the French king, in this sense, was so. Um, uh, was was so present into these these matters because that was a way to progressively acquire greater power through the um, through new incomes and um, there were also a lot of other um, say uh, f mm, uh, figures into the French court like collaborators. Mm, of various kind. There's also lots of other titles now we, we don't have time to cover them. Um, that comforted the king for uh, politi with political advice. Uh, this is obvious. For, uh, France at this time was huge. Uh, it needed um, a series of skilled uh, men of state, let's say, that, that could mm, refer to the king what the, the situation was in all the, in all the uh, uh, kingdom um, relatively to economics, politics, society, and all. Um, so the uh, the result of this is that the entire uh, institutional frame was um, resulted as subordinated to the sovereign in, in some way, and that it could intervene uh, in almost every every matter. Um, the um, another very important chapter about French. Um, about French monarchy is the progressive sacralization of the uh, king's figure. Um, this was a tradition that really came straight from uh, the Carolingian times that has Christian as well as pagans uh, as pagan um, uh, origins. Um, the um, the the essentially the uh, the king was um, conceived as the king's action uh, had certain religious connotations let's say and uh, Louis the Eight and especially Louis the Ninth that was as we've seen proclaimed saint uh, seventeen years after his death formally uh, even though during his life as we have recalled he already uh, had this fame of saint and for the very high for his very high morality and especially for a for a very um, um, strong sense of, of justice um, 
please read the Chronicle of, of Jean de, uh, Jean de Joinville, uh, which is the, the life of Saint Louis. It's a beautiful work that tells you so much about the French feudal world at the time, about not just about the figure of Louis IX, but also the really the French mentality uh, of the feudal uh, French aristocracy of the 13th century, and um, so all these. Um, um, First of all, it was very important for at the time for a kingdom to have uh, to have had a a holy uh, a holy uh, ruler because this obviously dignified the kingdom. It kind of made uh, his prestige rising, and in in the French uh, case especially, um, since the French were s historically stressing their own dynastic continuity, and therefore the divine nature not just of their kingdom but also of their own rulers as a sort of hereditary um, um, uh, in hereditary uh, succession together with obviously with the same mystical body of the kingdom that was very um, closely um, uh, related to, to the uh, king's person himself they began to strengthen uh, their monarchy also on ideological plan and uh, the um, um, and they began f for instance think about the um, the holy anointing of the French king his taumaturgical um, powers that is something really that you find also in part into the English uh, tradition that this is very important um, also, the king's. Uh, there is a beautiful book from. Uh, it's it's a it's a classic from uh, Ernst uh, Kantorowicz, the, the King's Two Bodies, that that tells beautifully all uh, all of these uh, topics, um, and uh, that if you're interested in 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 this sense in the French market, but also in the English one, that book is really for you. Um, there is all about how the symbolism was created, the idea of the king that. N that never dies as a person. I mean, the, 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 the mystical body of the king basically exists together with his um, earthly one, um, and, and the mystical body never dies. So, uh, the real meaning of the French monarchy stands in the uh, um, uh, in in the ritual that the, uh, the the French kings began to do when they were buried in in the um, in Saint Denis. Uh, Saint Denis, uh, you know that the, the war cry of the French king uh, of the French armies at this time was Montjoie Saint Denis. Montjoie is disputed as an origin. We don't really know what it means, but well, Saint Denis was the uh, the ab um, the abbey that um, uh, since a very early age, basically the the French kings were feudatories of. This is very interesting because it stresses how the French monarchy considered itself as of a loyal servant of the church. And Saint Denis is France. If you want to, to see the symbol of France, it's not the Tour Eiffel, it's not um, Notre Dame, it's it's not the Seine <laughs> and all. I, 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 um, uh, uh, it's definitely not um, uh, the um, uh, the all, all the other major um, uh, symbols of, of exterior symbols of, of France, but it's really the mystical meaning that lays within the French monarchy, really. And 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 if you really want to find a symbol, that's Saint Denis, the Abbey of Saint Denis. Well, all the French kings were buried, and the idea is was that was when they were brought into the crypt. Uh, the French standard uh, was brought together with them, uh, and when the king was buried, for a single moment, the the, fr the, the French banner went down, and that's when they say "Le roi mort," the king is dead, and then immediately the banner rises again, "Vive le roi," um, car la bannière ne meurt jamais. This is what, how the French say that because the, the flag never dies, the banner never dies because. The French monarchy lives on. Doesn't matter if uh, a French king dies; there's always another one because that's not something that dies together with the man. It's a mystical body that survives over time, and this is one of the most moving. I'm, I mean, I'm not French, so I'm not making 
uh, chauvinism <laughs> into this, but it's one of the most exciting and um, moving uh, things that uh, um, that really makes you understand uh, what it was the, the French monarchy in 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 the mind of that time. It's something really um, magic. Uh, uh, I, I will come back on this topic um, someday. Um, uh, and the um, we will try to to analyze it a, a bit more in depth because now I'm I'm just running also because this video is extremely long, <laughs> my God and um, well simply let's conclude a little bit um, that's m say that between the end of the 13th century and the first decades of uh, the 14th. The uh, political institutional asset of the French kingdom was further consolidated. Um, there was a, a better definition of the uh, organisms uh, proposed to um, uh, financial administration. This was very important because it was really a, a matter of money. You know, the greatest problem of all the greatest rulers at this time is money. Where do you, how, how do I find find money? Because the feudal system was essentially conceived as a sum of prerogatives that um, uh, that the, the local communities had not been uh, that had had since um, really uh, since forever. Because it doesn't matter whether they, they were of Germanic or Roman origin, but let's say that during the early Middle Ages, these prerogatives had been conceived as proper of lo uh, as a prerogative of the of the community that could not be touched and feudalism had been created ideally to defend this prerogative so that local communities wouldn't trust to kings and lords a uh, part of their own um, uh, income in order for them to, to be able to to provide military means to defend them so the idea that is that b beyond this military um, um, you know, service that eventually was translated into feudalism with this idea of the uh, beneficium and all. Uh, th the kings had no other right to basically ask for more money. So mm, at this time it was a huge ideological and juridical mm, mm, uh, theorization in order to, to back uh, the, the monarchic prerogatives and in, in turn to to counter them as well, but I must say that France um, developed since a very a very early age the idea as a as a community as a kingdom that the the the, the king was somehow um, um, allowed to do this partly because of the religious prerogatives that we have seen. Um, and uh, let's say that uh, compared to the all the other mm, European kingdoms, and this is very meaningful for all the premise that we have done relative to the Kingdom of France, generally the, the French kings were the ones who were more used, especially at the thresholds of the modern age, to, to impose new taxes in, in some measure. Because, and this was evident, because the idea is that the, the, str the larger your king, the your power is, the more resources you have, and the more you necessarily need to to centralize to to organize, because otherwise it's a mess. Mm -hmm. One thing is having a small community and organizing it in a sort of egalitarian fashion, but if you have a huge do dominion, uh, it, historically speaking, it's almost impossible to control it if you don't increase uh, your authority and you don't create a sort of um, you don't uh, increase uh, the degree of centralization of your of your state. Um, so the treasury and the court of the accounts were created, of the accounts were created. Um, so in this financial organization, this is by the way, the French monarchy and French bureaucracy at this time was very advanced also thanks to papal influence. Mm. Remember that at this time the Kingdom of France, uh, Papal Rome and the Kingdom of Sicily were all one in terms of uh, the Angevin Kingdom of Sicily were all ones in, in terms of mm, political mm, as a political bloc. There were lots of influences at this time uh, at the beginning of the 14th century the, the papal court uh, the papal curia moves to Avignon that that was at the border between the Holy Roman Empire in Burgundy and uh, and the Kingdom of France but it was essentially 
French uh, influence, not excessively much. There was n not this Avignonese captivity that is often stressed. The papacy was um, relatively independent from, from the French monarchy, but um, um, the papal courier had developed also very, uh, very sophisticated bureaucratic forms, and French definitely benefited in turn from that. So there was a lot of civilization that revolved um, around this uh, centralization process. And um, the um, Balifs and the Siniscalcs uh, uh, were therefore um, uh, also um, uh, flanked uh, on, on a local uh, at a local scale by some exactors of the uh, of the um, uh, of the uh, of the or taxes of levies, I don't have a better mm, term how to, to call them. Um, the ordinary taxes, let's say, because there, there, were, there was also, especially in times of war, mm, a lot of necessity for extraordinary mm, levies to, to be paid, especially during the 14th century with the big disasters after Crecy and uh, Poitiers. Um, the French monarchy was uh, at, at Poitiers. The, the, the French king uh, John II was captured by the English, and for ransoming him, the, the, the kingdom had to uh, to to run out to, to to bleed white essentially, and that's also the the reason why the Jacquerie spread in in those uh, years because it was this massive peasant revolt. It was really a mess. Um, so it was a let's say, a combination of uh, Philip the Fair, for instance, knocked out the Templar order by accusing them of heresy, simply because they were, mm, now with the fall of the, uh, of the Outremer states, they had grown militarily noxious, and, and yet they had a huge, huge quantity of houses all over France. I, if you take a map of, 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 um, of uh, France, um, of France, of, uh, of the Templar houses all over the, uh, uh, Europe at this time. There were lots in England, in Spain, in Italy, in Germany. But in France, it's really an enormous concentration. So that was, it's like when Henry VIII uh, made the, the schism and confiscated all the, the, the monasteries, <laughs> you know, monastery properties and all. It was essentially the same reason. How do I get money in a pre modern state? That was done. Uh, Philip the Fair, together with the um, with certain Italian nobles, also sacked the the papal uh, treasure at one point against Boniface the Eighth. Um, the uh, and, and and this in turn is exactly this last um, uh, event is has to be understood because of the attrition had started in spite of the kind of unchangeable lines between papacy and France at the end, ultimately. Um, because the French king at that point, because of its political and, and military power, and because of its uh, religious um, prerogatives, uh, had began to stress that the, um, the um, he had uh, prerogatives also in the French national church. Um, as the French Church, uh, essentially, and 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 this um, basically brought to the taxation of ecclesiastical uh, domains into France, something that the popes couldn't tolerate. So there was a huge clash. We will talk about this in a dedicated video. Now, it's really really long. Uh, <laughs> I'm I'm even tired of talking. But let's say that uh, the um, uh, just for th this is this video is just aimed at make you understanding how mm, what a massive entity the kingdom of France really was and how much uh, its uh, achievements really influenced all all of Europe in in what uh, they were trying to do for uh, um, for strengthening their monarchy and all so. I don't know how this video turned. Um, I stop here because also I forgot a bit of end hake, so <laughs> uh, it was hard to talk for an hour and a half. However, um, as always, I thank you for um, listening to me. I I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like. 
or subscribe to my channel and for now I I thank you once again for your attention uh, I will come back on these topics don't worry I know I, 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 I've told everything running but um, I will concentrate more specifically and for now I um, uh, I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye